Well, welcome to this tutorial, which is going to look at the basics of Pyro in Houdini 17. And Pyro in Houdini 17 is much like Pyro in Houdini 16, uh, except that the sourcing of smoke and flames has changed a bit. So we're going to focus particularly on that new workflow. The scene I've got here has a rocket, which you can see is animated along a path to crash into the ground. And what we want to do is create a plume of smoke coming out of the rocket. Now in this case I have written out the rocket as moving geometry into an alembic file and that would typically be the kind of scenario you would have in generating pyro. You'd have done a simulation or animated your geometry first and then just import it. Um, so let's import that into Houdini uh, which we can do using the alembic node. Let me point this at my moving rocket and I'll turn off the display of the first rocket and we should see exactly the same thing. And it's this node here that we're going to use for sourcing. So let's call it emit smoke. So when we create a simulation, a pyro simulation or a smoke simulation in Houdini, we've basically got two choices. Uh, we have either the pyro container, which would create a pyro simulation, or we have a smoke container, which creates a smoke simulation. In general, you'll want to use the pyro container because it can do almost everything the smoke simulation can do, uh, but do more. It has more controls over the shape of the simulation and so on. The smoke container is a bit simpler to use, um, so if you want a very simple simulation, you can use the smoke container. But let's use the pyro container in this case. So I'm going to control click this, which will lay down a container of default size. But of course, I need to have it so that it encapsulates my scene with my rocket. So I've used space three to get into a side view. There's my rocket. Here's my container. So I can pull this up so that it overlaps the rocket, maybe a little bit higher up. And then I can use the arrow here to move this one just below the ground plane. And then if I swap to a side view here, uh, there's our rocket. I can shift click these arrows here in order to move both parts of the container in like that. And the shelf tool, when I use that shelf tool, it's space and one to get back to the perspective view. It set up this network for me. Um, so it's created a pyro import node and somewhere down here it's created a dynamic simulation, a dot network called PyroSim. And if we have a look inside the PyroSim, it's got this node called Pyro, which is the thing uh, because it's currently selected, that's why we can alter the size of the container, as you can see that's specified here. It's got a pyro solver, it's a resized container, we'll come to that later, and then it just has gravity and output. So any time you want to tweak the size of this container, you just need to go into the simulation pyro sim network and select this pyro node. The pyro node also uh, gives you control over how you visualize the simulation, which are these fields down here. The other key thing is the division size here. Uh, that tells you how detailed your simulation is going to be. It's the size of each individual little voxel, each individual little element inside that container, which is going to be used to simulate smoke. So the smaller this is, the smaller this value is, the more detailed your simulation is going to be, but also the longer it's going to take to simulate. Now I happen to know that my computer will work reasonably fast if I set this down to point 0.1 and that will also give me a big enough uh, or more a detailed enough simulation to make this look reasonably good. So the next thing I want to do is to create some geometry to emit from. I'm not going to emit directly from the rocket. Uh, I want to emit from the end of the rocket here and I'm actually going to create some geometry. So let me select 
I need to unpack this of course and now I can select these points here so I'm pressing shift A to select round there and then I'm going to shift G to grow that I seem to have selected some points there by accident so control box select all of that to get rid of that and then I'm going to hit the delete key which is going to blast away that but if I click delete non select it's just going to leave that and then I'm going to lay down a poly extrude uh, select everything and then extrude this out say 0.3 and I want to make sure that we're also outputting the back like so and let me just see whether that, that looks okay so this is what we're actually going to use to output uh, smoke I'm going to give it a few more divisions like so. So this is going to make sure that our rocket is, does not emit smoke from the whole body of the rocket but only from the tail where you would expect the, the rocket uh, fumes to be coming out. So the next thing to do is to source our smoke from this emitter object and we do that using a populate one of the, the tools here on the populate container shelf and let me go back up to the object level what I uh, want to do in fact is to source from the volume so we have a number of choices here we can source from the surface so just the outside of the object we can source from the points that the object contains uh, we can source from the volume which means sourcing from the interior and the surface of the object and then these are not to do with sourcing these are to do with other aspects of simulation so I'm going to click source from volume I've already got that emitter selected so the next thing it's going to do is ask me to select the object to emit into and that in other words is the, the, the pyro container we set up after set up earlier on so I select that press enter and that should now have created some additional nodes here in this emit smoke node so this is what we had earlier down to the poly extrude and the new nodes that's created are create fuel add noise rasterize and then a null for out fuel and it's also created some nodes here in the pyro simulation it's created this source fuel from emit smoke node and wired that in to the pyro server come and have a look at that a bit later on. So let's go through these nodes which have been created in our emit smoke network. As I say, this is what we had before down to the poly extrude. So the first node that's been added is this thing called create fuel, uh, and this is a pyro source node. The new method of sourcing in Houdini 17, which is different from Houdini 16 and before, is to start by creating some points putting some attributes on those points that tell Houdini how much smoke or fire to emit and then adding some noise potentially to make that a bit random and finally at the bottom here to rasterize in other words to convert those points into a volume which can be used for sourcing the smoke and flames and in Houdini 16 that was done as part of a single node uh, which created from your geometry some volumes that we use for sourcing. So this is a little bit more complicated in that it involves two or three nodes, uh, but it's also more flexible and a little bit clearer as to what's going on. So the first thing we need to do is to have some points to source from. And you can do two things, two or three things here you can use the points that you've already got in your emission geometry so let me just turn off view of other things hide other objects so we just see this tail piece so we could just use the points that are here and that would be pretty much the same as anything from the surface of this thing or we can use uh, the 
volume scatter mode of the Pi resource to scatter points inside here and emit using those. Or there's another option here which is to surface scatter, so that's going to scatter on the surface. So let's have a look first of all at the volume scatter, and let me move the display flag down here. And the first thing we find is that there's nothing there. And indeed, if I middle click on this, you can see it says points primitive versus zero. And that's because for some reason at the moment, this version of Houdini is misjudging uh, the particle separation, misjudging how closely packed the particles should be, and therefore it's finding that there's no particles to fit in there. So I'm going to take this down to say 0 0.05. And now we can see it's filled that shape with points or particles. And it's also creating the attributes that we see here, fuel and temperature, on those points. And we can see here, fuel and temperature, and p-scale appear as uh, point attributes. p-scale is the size of the point. It's going to be used when we convert that into a volume to tell the converter how big each point should be in terms of the volume. And that's set simply by this uh, particle scale and particle separation. You multiply these two things together, so the p scale will be 0 0.05 times 2, which is 0.1. Now, you could decide that you don't really need these points. You're just going to use the points from your geometry, in which case you can change this to keep input. And there we see we've just got the points from our incoming geometry, but it's still going to create those attributes, fuel and temperature. So the next node is going to add noise, and we'll come on to that a little bit later on uh, and explain what that's doing. And then the final node is going to convert all of that into volumes, and it has a long list of attributes here that are going to be converted into volumes. In fact, some of these attributes won't exist on the points, and if they don't exist on the points, they won't be created. So in this case, the only volumes that are being created are fuel and temperature because those are the two attributes that we've got on our points. So as a bit of digression, I'm going to take a longer look at this point velocity node and its capabilities. Fairly briefly, but it's important to know. So I've just set up a, a test area here. We've got a sphere, and then filling it with points using the volume scatter, like so. Turn off that... Uh, visualization. And then I want to add noise. And I've got a switch node here to, to add different types of noise. So let's click on that. The first selection is just adding curl noise. So what I've done here is added a basic velocity going straight up, and then I'm adding curl noise. And as you can see, that's adding a little bit of variation to that velocity. The amount of variation is controlled by the scale. So if we increase it as you can see that gets bigger and bigger and it's animated so I can move backwards and forwards you can see that it changes and the that's because the animated box is ticked and how quickly that change is determined by this so if I put this up to two you can see that this changes much more slowly the swirl size determines how the noise varies over space so you can see if we increase that they're almost all pointing in the same direction because the noise is not varying that much across the area that we've got here. If we turn it right down, then you can see those are those are very large variations. And you're not probably going to need to ad address the turbulence and grain and so on. Those just tweak the noise underneath. And of course, the location attribute tells you what to feed into generating the noise. Almost always, you're going to want to use position for that. So that's curl noise. Uh, there's another type of noise at the end here called conical noise, and that's what we'll have a look at next. So I'll switch this over to look at the conical noise. And we can see that uh, the conical noise, we add noise with an angle around a direction. And just change that. So this is going to add, if we put this down to zero, all of our lines are going to point upwards. And as we widen the cone, you can see that that noise widens out like this. Very useful. Unfortunately, 
uh, conical noise doesn't vary well with time and it doesn't vary at all with place because the noise is based on a random value generated from the point number of the points. So if I to, were to transform this, uh, let me just put, make sure that is displayed right. If we were to transform this up and down, you can see that the noise doesn't vary with the position. Secondly, if we were to add an offset, global seed rather, related to time, we can see that at every frame it changes completely. There's no smooth transition from one frame to the next. So that makes it slightly tricky to use this uh, conical noise. And then the final uh, variant I want to show you is the velocity from object. Now in the case that we've got here, excuse me, turn that off, in the case that we've got here, uh, we had the rocket object. and We wrote it out to an Alembic file. If you have your original geometry, which has its transforms on it, on it here at the at the object level, and here we've got it animated using a constraint so that animation is at the object level, then you can bring that animation in using a point velocity from object, which is this tab here. So we add the object motion, and then we point it at the rocket, and as you can see that that is correctly reflecting the, the motion of the object. Now, our sphere here is stationary, so that that's not actually moving. All that's changing are the velocity attributes, which we're basically copying from the movement of that rocket object. So let's have a look now at what this is doing. I'm going to turn off the add noise because it can sometimes confuse things. It's easier to test what's going on if we turn that off to start with. And I'm going to go into our pyro simulation here. And the pyro simulation, as I mentioned, now has this source fuel from Emit Smoke. Emit Smoke is, is just the name of that network. And it's taking that its, its input from that null at the end of that network. And what it's doing is it's adding fuel and adding temperature into our simulation. And it's also adding velocity. Now, in fact, we don't yet have a velocity field, so that's going to have no effect for the moment. And let's just visualize this by looking at fuel for the moment, because fuel is what's being emitted. And we can see, let me move out, that yes indeed we do have some fuel. So let's, let's step forward in this, and we can see that the fuel is being emitted, uh, and then it's sort of trailing off there at the end. Yeah, you can see here it, it's kind of trailing off, and that it's got this sort of stepping to it. You, you're getting clear divisions between the bits of fuel that are being emitted, and that's going to cause a problem for your simulation. Well, there are two reasons why we're getting this odd uh, emission of fuel. The first one is that we haven't got our resized container set up properly. And the way that we can set this up properly is to get it to follow an object. So first of all, let me go back in here and let me stick a null. Oops, stick a null in here. So this is before we've converted things into smoke and so on. I'm just going to call this geo. And go back into our simulation and into our resize container. There are two... Th the purpose of the resize container is to try to minimize the size of your container. So if you have a look at the beginning, you can see that container is the size that we set it to, and that's always the maximum size. But at the start of our simulation, we're only going to be emitting stuff up here and the whole of this part here and this part is going to be empty. So what Houdini does is it reduces the size of the container so it just covers the areas where interesting stuff is happening. And by default it does that by looking at this density field, uh, that's the smoke field if you like, and seeing what's been emitted and narrowing down the box, the container, so that it just covers the area where there is density. 
that's quite often fine, but in this particular case, because we have a fast-moving object and we're emitting fuel rather than smoke or density directly, it's going to cause problems. So we have to use the diff a different method of tracking, which is the second field here, which is called tracking object. And the tracking object will allow you to track use a, an actual object in the scene, a SOP object, to track the movement. And we've got options here to track a, a DOP object. Well, we want a SOP object. And we want to select our objects, our emit smoke object, and our geo, which is that box that we, sort of emitting box. So that should now work more uh, correctly. So let's just have a look at this and we can see it's not stopping if we zoom in here we are still getting a certain amount of stepping here that, that you can see these are blobs they're not continuous as you would expect or hope but it is now going right the way to the bottom it's not petering out so that solved one of our two problems to solve the second problem uh, we're going to need to go back into our emitter because what's happening is that our object is moving so fast uh, let me just select our object that it's not moving from one frame to the next it's moving such a long distance that there's a gap in between the positions and that happens with any object that's moving very fast and one way to address this of course would be to go into our pyro simulation and to increase the sub-steps here and sort of calculate everything more times using a smaller time step but that's very expensive it takes a lot of time a better way to do it is to use something that's available here on our rasterize node which is called velocity blur and what will that will do is it will take the points that we've got coming into this and it will spread them out across an area which covers their velocity and thus create a volume that is blurred and ensures that frame to frame it overlaps and you're not going to get that stepping. But to use that uh, we're going to need to have a velocity attribute. Now sometimes <coughs> you would have a velocity attribute on your geometry coming in. Uh, this time we don't have it. Generally if you've exported a simulation from a dot network for example you will have a a V or velocity attribute on your points. We don't have it here, so we're going to need to create it. And we can do that using a node which, which comes with Houdini called point velocity. Uh, but there are some complexities to this, which I'll, I'll show you. Uh, so let's stay down at point velocity node. Okay, and then we're going to just compute from deformation. So this is going to take the geometry at one frame and the geometry at the next frame and providing the number of points has, has not changed it can calculate the movement from one set of points to another and it can create a velocity attribute based on that and we're going to need to visualize that attribute so let's lay down a visualize node and I'm going to call this V velocity vel maybe um, we're going to have a marker and it's going to be a vector and we're going to visualize velocity and I happen to know that we probably want uh, a little bit smaller scale so let's put our marker down here let's hit space G to zoom in on uh, the object and now at the first frame we don't we don't see anything because at that stage this hasn't started moving but we can see from the second frame onwards we get uh, everything that we want there and that looks good but the reason that's working is because we've got this mode set to keep input so it's basically keeping it is keeping the points of the geometry that are coming out of that limbic file. If I were to be scattering points um, whoops, uh, here to volume scatter uh, 
right? Let's have a look at what we get. You get some points inside that object. Uh, but now, wow, you're getting velocities going all over the place. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, in order for this calculation of velocity to work, uh, you need to have the same number of points each time. You need to be able to work out which point is the successor of, of which other points. Anyhow, it clearly doesn't work when you're using surface or volume scattering. So uh, you're going to need to do something else. So the things you can do, obviously, you can go back to just uh, using the geometry as it comes in. That works fine. But perhaps you can't because you need to have some points in the, in the inside of this. And so a different way of doing it is to go off to the side here, have a point velocity, have an input with your original geo, like that, point velocity, and then commute it, compute the velocity from, from deformation as before. And then we need an attribute copy. And the attribute copy will copy onto the points that are being created by this pyro source node, and it's going to copy from these. And the attribute I want to copy is V. And then let's feed that in, let's just disable that, into our visualize. And what we should now see, a second, have we got this set to volume scatter? There we are. And what we should now see here is that we're getting the right velocities on those points. So what we're now doing is going to use this rasterize node, and we're going to use the velocity blur capability. And this has three parameters. You probably don't need to worry about these two, but this one is important. Let's set the display flag on this and go somewhere down the middle of our range. So the velocity blur is going to use the shutter speed to work out how much of a blur to apply. So in this case, it's basically blurring along half of the size of our velocity. If we want it to go along the whole length, we press 1, and you can see uh, that this got bigger. You could even go to one half, which is, is kind of cheating. That would never happen in real life. But it may help you to eliminate that stepping that you saw earlier on. So let's go back to our simulation and have a look at that. And hopefully what we will see as we scrub forward in this is that there's less stepping. Still looks pretty bad to me. Uh, maybe that's because this is cached. Let me just make sure that we've reset the simulation. And then come in here. And we're still getting a certain amount of, of stepping there. So what I can do is, is go back into the emit smoke and increase the shutter, say, up to 1.3 maybe. Let's try rewinding that and then go into the pyrosim. It's still stepped a bit, but I think it probably won't matter so much when we're adding noise and so on. Another error that you sometimes get uh, when sourcing is that nothing shows up, that you, you don't get any emission. And that can sometimes be because the size of your grid, here it's 0.1, is too big for the size of your emitter. If your emitter is smaller than 0.1 units square, um, then possibly you won't get anything emitted because it won't it won't notice your emitter. Uh, you could check that by going down onto the rasterize node here, and you probably can't see all of this or indeed any of it. Let me see whether I can sort this around, and now we can see it. So I middle click. You can see you get here um, the size, and in this case it's 0.5 by 0.4 point f by 0.4. So a, ra a voxel size of 0.1 is fine, because this is 5 voxels by 4 voxels by 4 voxels, so plenty of space to have emission. Sort this back.
So let's have a look now at your annoys uh, functions. So what the noise is doing is it's adding noise to the values on those points based on their position. And you have noise which has a minimum value of minus one and a maximum value of plus sorry, minus two and plus two. It's animated, which means it's going to change over time as well as over position. These are the defaults. The element size has been calculated by Houdini. You, that's the main thing you're going to want to change. And your main thing, the other thing you want to change is the pulse duration. That's how quickly it changes with time. This is how big each sort of change is. And then at the end, uh, generally, you want to set the minimum so that it's zero, so that we don't get negative values coming into our density or our temperature. So let's have a look at simple frame of this. If we turn this on and off, you can see it's generally dimming down the, the, the noise a little bit, uh, dimming down the density that's being emitted. Let me turn off the visualization of those velocity. Where is it? I seem to still have the velocity being visualized. Never mind. So if we go through this, we can see it gets brighter and darker as we go through, which is which is the noise having an effect. It's not got much noise inside that volume, partly because we haven't got very many voxels in the volume. Uh, we could decide to reduce the scale of the elements, so down to 0.5 or even 0.1. Now you can see we're getting a little bit more variation in shape here on the on the density. And this will tend to make the simulation more interesting. So all other things being equal, you should use noise on your points because they will make things more interesting. And you'll want to tweak how fast the pulse duration changes and the element size as you hone the look of your simulation. So let's go look in uh, Pyrosim and have a look in more detail at what's going on here. Let's have a look first of all at the Pyro Solver and these tabs here. You may be familiar with these already, They're, they haven't changed much since Houdini 16. So this is the very basic stuff to do with your simulation. A key component here is this buoyancy lift, and this is the thing which takes gas, smoke, which has a temperature and gives it an upward force, so it tends to rise, and that counteracts gravity. Now for this kind of simulation where we're going to have a smoke trail, it's often easier rather than trying to balance the buoyancy lift and the gravity to switch off gravity and to set the buoyancy lift to zero. That's just going to leave the smoke basically hanging where it is. The next tab is the combustion tab, and there's a tick box at the top here which allows you to enable or disable combustion. There are two ways in which the Pyro Silver can operate. The mode that we're using at the moment is called the combustion mode. That takes fuel, it then burns it, it produces heat, uh, which is essentially flames, and it produces smoke, and it burns up the fuel. So once the fuel has disappeared, the smoke and the, and the flames disappear as well. If we turn this off, then the pyro solver becomes very much like a standard smoke solver. Instead of emitting fuel, uh, it's l it, sorry, instead of expecting to have fuel come in here in the sourcing node, it expects to have density, i.e. smoke, and it then just emits the smoke as you might do in a smoke solver. The advantage over the smoke solver is you get these controls here on the shape tab which are different ways to control the look of your smoke and flames. And we'll come on to those in a moment. So we're going to use the combustion model. And by default, that's what Houdini, the shelf tools, set up. They set up the combustion module. And therefore, we have coming in here fuel, temperature, 
and velocity. You can see at the top here, there's a little control to initialize this. We can initialize this to source smoke. And then it just has density and temperature and velocity. So instead of fuel, it's expecting to get density coming in here. So let me put that back to source fuel. Back here on the emission side, uh, this node here, the pyro source, also has an initialize control, which has source fuel, and it has source smoke. So if we were to say source smoke, then uh, we would get density. Fuel should be deleted, in fact, but we would get density and temperature. Delete, delete that, and delete that, and delete that, and let's see whether this now works. So source fuel gives you fuel and temperature, delete those two, and source smoke gives you density and temperature. So delete the density, go back to source fuel, we'll get temperature and fuel, we're back to where we started. So if you want to swap from using the, the fuel model, the combustion model, you need to change this initialized tab here, and you will need to change it down here on the source uh, fuel as well. So now let's try and hone the look of our simulation. So go down into our PyroSim and let's play this through. So at the moment what we're seeing is the fuel being emitted. You can see there's a little bit less of it because we've added noise. Uh, but what we want to see is the smoke. So primarily I'm going to emit smoke from the back of the rocket. Maybe a little tiny bit of flame right close to the rocket itself. And in this model density is basically smoke so let's turn that on turn off fuel and it's very faint we can hardly see it so let me go to the density tab and one of the things we can do is up the smoke density for visualization purposes there we are we can now see that it is indeed emitting smoke just not very much there we are okay so the next thing we need to do is is work out how to give that smoke a little bit more body and we can look here on the combustion shelf or the combustion tab and there is a control at the bottom here which is gas released that basically tells Houdini how much smoke to emit for each unit of fuel that it burns so I'm going to up this really high and the other thing I can do is tick this box which says create dense smoke and dense smoke means that the smoke can accumulate in the same place now normally Houdini would stop smoke being added where there's already a lot of smoke this allows smoke to be added even where there is a lot of smoke so you can get smoke density that's greater than one the other thing that does is use something called divergence I'm not going to go into that in detail uh, which forces smoke apart. It's what would happen naturally. If you're pumping a lot of smoke into an area, then naturally there would be pressure and the smoke would expand. And that's what is simulated if we tick this create dense smoke. So let's go back and simulate that again. And go back up to frame 35, say. And we can immediately see that we're getting more smoke, that it's, it's expanding more and it's, it's getting sort of slightly wavy lines around here and that's because of these shape nodes probably let's turn that off for the moment press play so it's still rather thin and part of the reason for that i think is that it when we're sourcing things here we're adding amongst other things velocity so by default this smoke is acquiring the velocity of the rocket, so it's shooting downward extremely fast, and that's not necessarily what you want. That's going to tend to draw out the smoke, uh, whereas in reality the smoke might even be going backwards a little bit. So let me give it a velocity of minus 0.1, and then what should happen is the smoke will be a little bit thicker. There we are. That's now looking a bit more like what you might expect.
let's have a look again at these controls. So the first one let's go into is dissipation. I've done a whole video on, on these different controls. They haven't changed since Houdini 14 or 15, so you can look at that video, still relevant. So the first thing is dissipation. This is the evaporation of gas over time. It tends to disappear. If we set this up really high, we play our simulation, you can see that the gas is tending to disappear. Let me set that down to say 0.2. The other thing uh, that you might want to introduce is either disturbance or turbulence. Both of these add a random movement to your smoke. Uh, let's start off with turbulence, and we'll leave it at 0.1. And the swirl size I'm going to take down to 0.5, just to see how that looks like. We're still getting fairly thin smoke, so let me in fact why don't we uh, keep that, we'll keep this gas released at the same level but here on the source node I'm going to take the fuel and I'm going to scale it up so we're getting more fuel coming in each frame and that should give us more smoke, there we are that's looking better already. Good. And then the turbulence is adding, as you can probably see, it's adding some random movement. Let me just increase this right up so that you can see it more clearly. And as you can see, that that's really dissipating the smoke take it down to 1.1. The other uh, thing you can use is disturbance. Uh, and this creates similarly some random movement in our smoke, like so. And you can keep on doing this to get variations in your smoke. I still think we haven't got quite enough smoke here, so let's go back. That's a bit more like it. So what you would tend to do is you would re-simulate again and again and again, tweaking these values until you've got something that looks uh, like what you would like to see, and then you can render it out. I'm not going to go into the detail of this. As I say, there's a separate video which shows you, and indeed I've done variations on each of these to, to show the effects of, of the different controls. So the next thing we're going to do is look at how all of this is rendered, very briefly. I've already set up a camera here, so the camera is a little bit too far away, perhaps. Let me zoom in. We'll render this bit just for just for demonstration purposes. I've got a light uh, which is looking down somewhere. Where is it? There is a light somewhere. Can't see it at the moment. There we are. There's a light there. So if I just render this using the standard render region tool we will eventually get something like this. And let's, let's extend this down so that it's covering where the rocket is. And indeed, perhaps let's enable the rocket so we can see the rocket too. OK, um, this is great, except that we've got rather a big trail of flame coming out here. I probably just want flame down the bottom here. So by default, when we use the shelf tool to create our pyro simulation, it also creates a shader, the hot smoke shader, which we've got here. And we can edit this to change the way our smoke is going to be rendered. So the first thing here, the density, is going to tell you how thick your smoke is going to be. So if I this down to one. As you can see, the 
the smoke basically disappears. If I put it up to 150, uh, then the smoke gets a lot thicker. Let me leave it at the default. You can tweak this as you like. Noise would add noise to your smoke. In general, you don't want to do that. Uh, it just doesn't look very natural most of the time. And then the other really important control here is the temperature. And that's, this, that's the control that's creating this red and yellow shading here. And what it's doing is it's taking the temperature field and it's creating an emission, a glow, for areas which have high temperature. And it's giving them a color according to this ramp here. So cold is black, very, very hot is white. I can reduce this and then we'll get less still get some, we're still getting some, but you get less of a emission. So let's put that at two. Now maybe that's okay, maybe that's what you want, um, but in general it's going to probably not be appropriate to have this red up here. So I'm going to set this down to zero. The other control is something that changes the color of your smoke according to the temperature field and that's what this ramp here does and as you can see by default it just gives you white everywhere so let me add a couple more controls and let's give it a yellow color let's just copy this copy parameter come down here look at this paste copied values and then let's have a red here okay and maybe a red red here as well and this is needs to be uh, not linear, but Bezier, for example, that'll give us a better. And this is giving us a little bit of a giving us a bit of a red tinge just coming out of the back of our spaceship or our rocket, which is perhaps what we want. You can change the colours here to make that a, a yellow tinge or whatever. I should note, by the way, that this hot smoke shader is a sort of simplified pyro shader. There is, uh, down here somewhere, a more sophisticated, let's use the tab key, go into our material network, and you can use the pyro shader here, which has many, many more controls to affect the look of your smoke and flame and that works on the fields that come out of a pyro simulation. You may need that if you've got a very sophisticated explosion or something that you want to tweak the look to a very high degree. Often you can achieve what you want using the simpler shader. It's the one we've been looking at, which is the, the hot smoke shader. So finally, a word or two about the mantra rendering parameters. Let's have a look, though, first at what is actually being rendered. So this was our object nodes. And as you can see, the pyro simulation, which is what we've been looking at when we've dived inside and visualized it here, doesn't have the display fact set. So that is not being rendered. Instead, what is being rendered is this pyro import node, which was created by the shelf store tool. And this has a node which is importing the relevant fields from our pyro simulation and these are going to be what's rendered so it's it's importing density velocity rest and rest too which we're not actually creating temperature heat fuel and color again cd color we're not using so if these fields don't exist in our simulation it's, it, it will silently ignore them and just create the fields that will bring in the fields that do and it's these fields that are going to be used by the shader and by Mantra to create the rendering that we see here. Let's have a look now at the Mantra render node and the things that are relevant to volume sampling. 
volume rendering rather. So let's have a look at the rendering tab. And on the sampling tab, we have some controls at the bottom here for volumes. And the things which will tend to increase the quality of your render, but reduce, uh, sorry, increase the render time as well, are these controls here. So in general, you want to keep stochastic transparency on. Uh, that's a way of optimizing uh, volume renders that, that makes them much more much quicker. And if you want to increase the quality, you can increase the number of samples here. That will increase your render time. The other thing that will tend to increase the quality of your render is the volume step rate. So in this case, the default means that it's sampling one out of every four voxels. You remember a volume consists of little cubes. The, the, that container we saw earlier is filled with hundreds of thousands of little cubes, which are called voxels. And we saw earlier we set the width of those to 0.1. So each of those is a little box, 0.1 by 0.1 by 0.1. And this control is saying, don't sample every single one of those. Just do one out of every four. And 0.25 is one over f uh, four over one over four quarter. So it, it samples one out of every four. If we were to increase this to one, that would then sample every voxel, and you get a better result, but it will take longer. The volume shadow step rate is a factor applied to this, which allows you to reduce the quality, reduce the amount of time taken to render shadows for smoke. Now, in this case, we're not casting shadows. It's not really relevant, particularly. But you could, for example, uh, set this to think it uh, yeah so you can go down to say 0.1 or something like that and that will make it quicker to render the shadows but they will be less accurate without affecting the quality of the render of the smoke itself so that's a quick run through over one example of using pyro in Houdini 17 I hope it's been useful.